Boga sa ume bit. Kad ba to ne bude, ba to ne bo. Ne ba mi bude. Ar mogi da gino če mi amram indeli sa ubris stumrebi. Ese ni alen Amerike li musiko sebi. Ah algas da Amerike li pianisti Dan Tepfer. Aris če mi stumari amram da Amerike is pianista asociacije is presidenti Joel Harrisoni. Če ni amram indeli sa ubris tema, da kao si rebu lik ne ba. Musikis ori ganzo mi lebi surti ar to basta. Ne sari džazuri musika ar ti skriv, da klasikuri musika. Da me getkli tu ratom, a vi ci a is tema. Imi to ro, den teferi, garda imi se ro, ari samo mavali vašklavi, amerikuli džazuri, fortepianosi. Ama vedro si gi gaklavt klasikuri fortepianos profesionalis, klasikuri fortepianos ištem su lebeliz. Mi si mastav lebeli, kakl dat, še sa nič davi kartveli pianisti Aleksandri Korsantija, romelic amžama da stavli iz Ameriki še rtebu. Štatevši, a se rom den teferi, a jam organzo mi leba še im opeba, džazuri da klasikuri musikisa. I se vero gorc, bat oni Joel Harrisoni, romelic Saris, Amerikis pianista asociacijis prezidenti, sada če dijan orive ganhris pianista, bilo gorc džazuri, a se ve klasikuri porte pianos zavromat gen lebi. Tko nis nebar tuit, me čo nis tumre bis gasa gebena za gada vrtve bi, da še bi ste virom ore na šoris i mozrao. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Welcome to our show. Thank you. It is my pleasure to host you here. Thank you. It's this show pleasure. is called Late Night Talk, and so I suggest to talk about a very interesting topic, I mean, to discuss a topic called the relationship between jazz music and classical music. Mm -hmm. But before we delve into this thing, you've been here for almost a week since last Saturday, and you traveled in the country. Uh, you. Then you had concerts in Batumi, Zukdidi, and Sohumi, mm -hmm. which is very important, very important uh, story for Georgians. So, what are your impressions so far about the country, about the audience? Um, you know, my I, the, the 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 big memory that I'll come away with uh, regarding Georgia has to do entirely with the people. The uh, I found the Georgians to be so welcoming and so um, so warm, so warm-hearted. And more than that, more than being just welcoming, warm-hearted, because those are the kind of things you say about, you know, when you go to a new country, sure. you often say that they're like inquisitive. And I feel like the Georgians um, that I've talked to are interested in a lot of the same things in art that I'm in interested in. I mean, for example, for me, it's always important that art try to reach for something that's that transcends our human experience you know and almost every georgian i've talked to it seems like that's a common topic that people like to talk about this is not necessarily the case in the united states for example maybe because your teacher was georgian i mean alex <laughs> corsantia maybe he taught you this yeah maybe maybe yeah <laughs> uh, uh then skonta ramodeni me koncerti uh sakartvelo shi machoris batum shi zugdichi da sohum shi so I think that the concert is a very interesting thing about this style. But I think that the most interesting episode is Zugdici. I think that I'm going to talk about it and I'm going to talk about it. What about the episode you had in Zugdidi when you had a concert there and a lady from the audience came up stage and expressed her excitement? Can you tell our viewers about this? Yeah, talk about warmth, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And being fully embraced. Sure. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> You know, I mean, here I was playing a concert and, you know, I felt like I was really enjoying myself mm -hmm. um, and I finished the tune and a woman in the front row stands up. She walks to the, to, walks towards me with a big bouquet of flowers mm -hmm. and hands it to me and says something in Georgian, mm -hmm. which I assume was positive. You know, there's some, some nice flowers. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, that's the first time that's ever happened to me. <laughs> the and middle. then she asked you to give her a chance to play herself, I think. Yeah, yeah that was it. She gave me the flowers. Actually, that came a little bit later. She mm -hmm. gave me the flowers, mm -hmm. let me play a few more tunes, and then she stood up and asked uh, to play herself. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's the first time that's happened to me, but I, I <laughs> it was really great. Weird. What can I say? Yeah, well, well, I think she was just so inspired that she wanted to share her own music mm -hmm. uh, with you and uh, with those who were enjoying the concert. This is a real feedback or response you have. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes, ideal, I would say. Ideal. Uh, uh, you also performed with the Georgian uh, uh, Tbilisi Municipal Jazz Orchestra. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would like to ask Joel and you, as 
professionals what do you think about this orchestra there are no many uh, uh, jazz bands available in eastern europe yeah. let's say in this part of the world especially and what's your idea of this orchestra i can tell you it's a great treasure mm -hmm. and uh i was so pleased to learn that this is in fact a mu municipally funded yeah. orchestra and i think that that is <coughs> a remarkable vision of the leadership of the city to take on that kind of uh, funding, you know, mm -hmm. for for uh, a musical organization of that sure. nature, and uh, while while we do have, uh, you know, a number of uh, similar big bands uh, in the United States, and, and we have a really marvelous one mm -hmm. where where I'm from in uh, mm -hmm. Indianapolis, uh, for the most part, they're not uh, funded by the city. And uh, so, so I was really surprised, but uh, but pleasantly so. And it is a terrific, terrific yes. uh, band. Absolutely, absolutely. And their leader is an exquisite jazz musician. Absolutely, he's an Very old impressive. timer jazz yes. musician who In worked every a way. lot everywhere. Yeah. What's your impression, Dan? Are you okay with this? <laughs> because you you you're going to perform uh, uh, with them in the conservatory hall. Yeah, I'm more than okay, Zareb. Uh, okay, I'm yeah. I'm really impressed, and it's a real pleasure playing with them. I mean, it's like the vibe is great. The vibe is great everywhere in Georgia. You know, mm -hmm. it's amazing. Uh, but also musically, they're they're great. You know, we we're playing some pretty difficult charts, yeah. some charts that were actually written especially for me um, for the through the American Pianist Association mm -hmm. uh, by a by an, an American. Um, arranger and big band leader named Brent Wallerob mm -hmm. uh, and they're really pretty challenging and the guys are really well prepared and playing them beautifully I think it's going to be you know it's yes it's in excellent. fact when this uh, possibility came up through our conversation with the uh, United States Embassy here which is of course sponsoring this trip um, and it was suggested that maybe he could play with this big band and I said well I, I think that's a great idea I said we have <coughs> these uh, charts that we've commissioned uh, for part of our jazz competition, of which uh, Dan is the winner. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, I'm happy to send that to you, but, but they're rather challenging. You know, these are difficult uh, mm -hmm. things, and, and we're, we're fortunate because we have we're what we think is a really top-notch mm -hmm. band in Indianapolis, and certainly a first-class arranger, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, not really knowing uh, the Tbilisi band, uh, I was a little apprehensive, mm -hmm. but uh, we sent the charts ahead and uh, sent a recording uh, from the competition when Dan uh, premiered, premiered it and then got here and boy, they sound terrific. Embarking upon the occasion, I'd like to extend uh, my thanks and our thanks to the American Embassy right. uh, here, Ambassador Taft, uh, to uh, Cynthia Whittlesey, uh, the cultural affairs officer who kind of uh, arranged this, made made this uh, right. project possible and made made this visit possible. Maybe the model of Moloxeno Ameriki Sierte Bustate Bisalchos, Sakatoloshi, Baton Tevs, Calbaton Cynthia Wittlesis, or the Mats, Chesas de Belgahades, I'm scientist of project is Gan Hortzieleva, or is that American pianisti, Astruleps, Tbilisi's municipal, Jazz Orchestra Nertat, Ramo de Vez, Artur, the scientist of compositions. Okay, so now let's, let's, let's uh, talk about your musical biography, Dan. Uh, we're very kind of uh, flattered and impressed to hear that uh, Alex Corsanti was your teacher, a Georgian kind of musician, was yeah, your teacher. A great Georgian musician. What's, what's, uh, uh, who was the first to introduce you to jazz music? Well, um, you know, it's, it goes so far back for me. I mean, I, I was immersed in jazz from a very, very young age. And one of my earliest memories is hearing my grandfather play jazz. He was a, a jazz pianist in Oregon on the American West mm -hmm. Coast. And, you know, I'd just be, there'd be a party, a, even just a dinner party with family at their house in, in Oregon. And he would always get up and play at the end. And often he would accompany my mom, who's a singer. So I was always immersed in, in that music. And, and for me, the concept of improvisation was always something that was very natural and mm -hmm. something that anyone could do. So when I started piano lessons when I was six, you know, w with the Paris Conservatory, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, there was no question in my mind that if I thought one of the pieces I played could be a little better if I changed it a little bit like that, mm -hmm. then I could do that, you know, why not? <laughs> <laughs> so you started to improvise. The first seeds of improvisation <laughs> in, your, in your mind. Mm -hmm. I remember in 1950s, 60s, there was a piano fad in Georgia because every family was supposed to have a piano. Mm -hmm. Some of them had two. Mm -hmm. And it was almost mandatory for every kid mm -hmm. to go to a music school to learn how to play piano. Yeah. 
I suffered a lot from this <laughs> myself. It took me three years, you know, to go through this kind of trial, etc. But afterwards, I was kind of released. Uh, I remember the same kind of fad of piano was in the United States in late 19th century uh, that every family also, right. mm -hmm. even African Americans, right. who were not rich at that time for this, but they would put the last kind of cent or dollar to buy a piano and to uh, make them, uh, their the, the children learn how to play. Uh, and this fad caused uh, uh, an explosion, I mean, in these terms, of the new music, purely American kind of music, which is called ragtime, ragtime piano. Yep. Uh, and this was a great period, I mean, if you think about the pre-jazz history, uh, the music which kind of prepared right. the uh, territory for the jazz to emerge. So this was a great period in, in these yes. terms. And I remember there was an organization called American Association of Musicians who imposed ban on performing ragtime, you know, because right. it was below the classical taste. Mm -hmm. Right. How are things today uh, in terms of kind of piano education? And well, that, that's uh, something we talk a lot about. Uh, the sale of uh, acoustic pianos is down uh, nationwide and uh, and generally it's down uh, worldwide with the <coughs> possible exception of China which has a vast uh, piano studying population and, and producing I understand uh, this is true not only about piano <laughs> right but right. any other kind of field of human experience right. I'm sure right uh, there are fewer people in the United States studying piano and um, fewer people buying pianos and um, at least acoustics. Uh, I think the uh, you know digital pianos uh, are, are doing okay. I think that what we see is just a change in how people spend their time. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there's any less interest in music or, or even in music making. Mm -hmm. I think it's just how it takes place and where it takes place. Mm -hmm. And I mean the the internet and the recording industry and the availability of vast amounts of information, uh, in particular music, has changed our culture. Um, and you uh, remark uh, about the fact that uh, so many households, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, had pianos. And you know, the, the piano was the focus of uh, the family life, you know, gathering around the piano to make music. Uh, and even 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 in uh, my childhood, this is before television, right? Sure. Exactly. You know, so there was more time uh, available for that, and the piano sort of filled filled that spot. Um, I th in the United States, the piano still um, is probably the primary instrument by which uh, most children uh, learn something about music. Um, is it as pervasive as it once was? Mm -hmm. uh, no. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. But you know, I mean, personally, I'm, I'm a pianist. I love the piano, um, and uh, so I have a special relationship with it. But I, you know, it's like what Joel was saying: the fact that there's fewer piano sales doesn't say anything about a decline in music. I mean, people are just as interested in music as ever, and I think it's, I think it's just as important to explore new ways of making music. You know, with computers or anything electronic, uh, or just experimenting with sounds as it is to learn to play the piano. I mean, you know, the piano is, is an incredible instrument to discover orchestration. I mean, you can do everything with the piano. You can basically reach all the techniques of Western classical music, you know, and other types of music, too. But I, I don't feel so overly sentimental about, you know, that everybody should have a piano. Everybody should be interested in music. Everybody sure. should be listening to music, but piano, sure. you know? Course, well, it remains a great way uh, or a great um, vehicle instrument uh, for teaching children, um, and uh, because the you know to ultimately play the piano well, um, you have to be able to read uh, at least uh, two clefs uh, at once. It requires a kind of eye-hand coordination uh, that uh, we don't find you know in some other aspects, uh, such as playing soccer. Uh, <laughs> Um, and it tends to develop the brain in especially beneficial <laughs> ways that we're finding. But, I, but like Dan said, um, I, I'm not convinced that the decline in piano sales necessarily indicates a decline uh, in the interest in music. 
Oh sure, and I, I c as far as I know, it's from you. Uh, uh, the, there is interest in kind of uh, bringing very weird combinations uh, in terms of uh, creating music today in America. You were telling me that somebody came up with a concerto for cell phone and orchestra. Right. <laughs> <coughs> what was the concerto <laughs> uh, about? I mean, what, what was it about? about? Well, it's by uh, David Baker, mm -hmm. who <coughs> I consider a colleague. Uh, David is actually head of jazz studies at Indiana University. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've known David for quite some while because I was a student at mm -hmm. Indiana University and now uh, the executive offices of the American Pianist Association are located in Indianapolis. Um, so I am at Indiana University with fair uh, degree of frequency and I see David. Um, like many of us, uh, he has uh, had the experience of being in a concert um, and hearing someone's cell phone go off. and either being disturbed by it or amused by it or you know whatever that particular uh, situation uh, produced for him so uh, clever and creative man that he is he simply got the idea well why don't we simply incorporate this into a piece of music and so uh, it actually has audience participation uh, so you have your orchestra on stage you have your solo cell phonist <laughs> of which there are several and they're lined up across the stage but then the audience is called upon at several points in the piece to play their cell phone you know the, the ringtones of that and uh, it's pretty fascinating to, to hear all amazing. that taking place you know in the concert hall my idea is I would like to suggest to our cell phone companies uh, owners to kind of uh, Capitalize on this right. project. I will say it in Georgian. President, President, Concertist Dros. Sainteresu projektia da, vem goni sainteresu komerciul da PR akcija ikne voda uribe kompanija isatvis. Okay. You know, you could actually commission a whole um, uh, opus, if you will, of works for cell phone. You could have the concerto, you could have a chamber work for cell phone. Cantata. You could, a uh, cantata for cell phone. Uh, you could have cell phone ensemble. Sure. <laughs> you know, it's funny, th those kinds of ideas to me are closer to theater than to music. Sure. Well, yeah. you know, it's, it's, like performance. it's performance art. This is not yeah. new. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, they would show on TVs, it, 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 it was from 1930s, a concerto for typewriter. And right, yeah, yeah. Yes. And we, d we talked about the concerto for 100 metronomes, right? Yeah. This is right. Ligeti's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right. Yeah. Yeah. And, well. and, and you might know, who is it that wrote the piece for 18 radios? <laughs> oh, that was not Cage. Is that Cage? I think I, I, yeah. John okay. Cage. I think yeah, it's, I think I think it's so. John Cage. Right. Yeah, 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 but that's true. a similar yeah. you know, kind human of inventiveness thing. has no yeah. limits. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, let's get back to more. <laughs> get down to serious serious matters. Oh, interesting. Uh, uh, Dan, you have also a degree in astrophysics. This is also very interesting. What? Uh, kind of brought you to astrophysics. Why astrophysics? It was during your musical education or before that you have a degree from the University of Edinburgh? Yeah. Um, I, you know, ever since I was a kid, I was, I've always just, I remember one time I had a conversation with my dad who, um, who's, a, who's a biologist mm -hmm. and I was asking him, where is the end of the universe? I was like, you know, if you take a spaceship and you go far, far, far in one direction, you must come to something. There must be a wall, <laughs> you know? And I literally, in my mind, I had this, this picture of a, of a big brick wall surrounding the universe, mm. you know? <laughs> and um, I've, it's always been fascinating to me. I, I, can't, I can't be outside at night and, and look up at the sky and not wonder what's going on out there. And it's really incredible to me what scientists have been able, able to discover. I mean, it's, um, it's way more, way crazier than anything that any religion has ever thought of. You know, it's, it's really completely mind boggling. And I, I love that. Um, Music and uh, 
astrophysics or kind of cosmology. Uh, these two fields uh, have always had kind of uh, the desire to get closer. I mean, if we look at the history of philosophy, etc., from the times of Pythagoras you know, mm -hmm. uh, and Kepler. Harmony uh, of the spheres. Harmony of the spheres, Kepler's harmony of the spheres. Music was used as a kind of cultural tool to interpret interpret the universe. Even the guy, the man, uh, the man who grew up in this city in Tbilisi, uh, his name is George Gurdjieff, Georgi Gurdjieff, uh, uh, and uh, his kind of system as well, cosmological and cosmogonical, is also mm -hmm. based on music. Uh, and uh, this is very interesting kind of uh, mixture uh, uh, of different kind of cultural dimensions. Uh, what about, and we mentioned Paul, Paul, Paul Hindemith, who did right. the music of the spheres. Uh, right. so what about contemporary American musicians? Is anybody kind of trying to do the same kind of cosmological, musical uh, writing? Um, well, se several do come to mind. Uh, I, I don't know that they come from a background in uh, astrophysics. Uh, uh, I've never thought to ask that question to some of the uh, composers. I'm sure and, they read the books. Yeah, may, right. <laughs> Um, you know, I'm thinking of one work in particular, uh, a, a very monumental work uh, by a favorite composer of mine, George Crumb. Uh, this is a work written in the uh, 1970s called The uh, Macrocosmos, and it's in two books. Uh, there are 24 pieces, 12 in each. Uh, it's for amplified piano, but uh, it's called After the Signs of the Zodiac. So each of the 12 pieces has a sign of the zodiac assigned to it and um, I listen to that music and and I sort of hear this uh, cosmic quality and, um, and I, I sense that you know an exploration of sound uh, you know pushing the limits of sound uh, kind of like what Dan was saying other about where's the end of uh, the galaxy or the end of the universe and I hear in Crumb uh, his exploring this vast universe of sound uh, uh, and even though it's written for a piano um, you know it is using uh, many of the uh, different resources of the instruments so just playing inside mm -hmm. uh, stroking the strings mm -hmm. uh, and not working just on the upper end of it but on the uh, very 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 quiet end and the uh, amplified quality um, sort, of, sort of adds to that and gives it this sort of special uh, you know, the sound of the universe, if you will, so or a cosmic this case, quality. Yeah, in this case, it. the grand piano is the microcosm. Right, yeah. Well, he would say the macro macrocosm. Yeah, the but the, the, the grand piano is micro. the microcosm yes, of the macrocosm. Yes, right, right. Exactly. You know, that, that makes me think of something. I, I live in Brooklyn, in, in Brooklyn, in New York, and um, there's a singer-songwriter who lives also in Brooklyn whose name is Sufjan Stevens, mm -hmm. and he... This is another conversation we could have. Not only does jazz and classical come mm -hmm. together, but folk music and classical come together. Oh, sure. and, and he's a, a singer-songwriter, you know. Um, and he just wrote, well, actually, it was a while ago, he wrote a, a, su a suite of pieces also based on the signs of the Zodiac. Mm -hmm. And um, one of my good friends plays in his band mm -hmm. and recently did transcriptions of all of these pieces that were originally written, you know, for electronic uh, instruments and voice and all these modern techniques. He did, trans he did transcriptions of each one of these pieces for string quartet. Mm -hmm. And I saw them perform and it's really inspiring to me to see those worlds come together like that. And there we yeah, go, sure. there's an exploration of, you sure. know, the sure. cosmos. Yeah, right. Another, another uh, music organization, musical organization, organization which comes to my mind now, which thematized the cosmic element is the Rolling Stones. They had a concert called Big Bang, if you remember. Uh -huh. Yeah, sure. Well, okay. <laughs> I, I, I was just joking. <laughs> but Big Bang. I think is that's the, the other end of the, sure. the, the universe, from sure. which we're talking about in terms of it expanding. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Getting back to our topic, jazz and classics. Uh, if you look at the history of jazz music in the United States, American jazz musicians, well, um, African American jazz musicians, had always had the inspiration kind of to to share the experience of European classics, to emulate uh, the composers, European classical composers, 
we remember Scott Joplin who right. tried to write an opera, he did ballet, right. uh, he tried to imitate, to emulate again European uh, romantic uh, composers, maybe it was not a good idea to do, but eventually he came up with his own original and brilliant music which is called ragtime music. Uh, uh, Duke Ellington, he tried to kind of uh, merge European symphonism and jazz idiom. Mm. They were minor, well, guys like, um, people like George Gershwin, who yeah. also, Zez Comfrey, and all these people, they were more smoother and sweeter types like Paul Whiteman, but this was kind of very easy and very yeah. simple, simple music. But uh, then comes the period when uh, jazz and classics uh, really intensify their dialogue, and this is early 1950s when cool jazz uh, emerges, uh, which is also called by some scholars as Europeanized jazz. Uh, the, the, another name is West Coast jazz, but uh, this uh, kind of rapprochement with European classics and, uh, of jazz becomes very essential with such musicians as uh, you know, Gil Evans uh, or Danny Tristano, Dave Brubeck. Uh, what is this experience for you? I mean, this period when jazz and classics start to come very close to each other. Well, you know, the thing is, that had been happening for so long, like wh what you're saying. I mean, Gershwin was one of the most, in, w was extremely interested in classical music and actually was, is one of the quote-unquote jazz musicians who had the most success in, bri in bridging the two. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's not something that was new. I mean, what happened in the 1950s is that it kind of got labeled. You know, people like Gunther Schuller came up with expressions <laughs> like third stream, mm -hmm. and there's, a, yeah, there's this stream. expression, cool jazz, right. which got basically, you know, someone at some point decided to say, this is something that incorporates elements of mm -hmm. Western classical music and jazz. But the truth is, is, is that it, it had been happening since the very beginning. Um, you know, for me, I mean, jazz, actually, what jazz is, is a combination of African rhythms. I mean, there would be no jazz without Africa. Sure. And classical sure. techniques such as advanced harmony and you know, very advanced chromaticism and melodicism and all of that. So, I mean, it's always been that. And I don't know exactly, you know, the more I research this topic and the more I feel like maybe there wasn't you know, one time when this started to happen. It's just, at some point someone labeled it. You know. Yeah, this has been uh, happening from the very beginning of jazz, of course, and jazz is a mixture of African, um, African tradition, European tradition, but it got its unique uh, idiosyncratic form uh, in the United States at the time. But in 1950s, I mean, this became thematized. I mean, yeah. people were thinking about exactly. it, people were trying to develop this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, some say it was successful. To me, it was very enriching, both for jazz yeah. and for uh, classical uh, kind of music, and this had been going on since then. Uh, how are things today in these terms, in terms of dialogue between jazz and classical music and American music? Um, and, and you know, Dan might have his own take on that. Um, I think it's interesting that in the United States, uh, jazz and classical both garner about the same percentage of uh, the overall music market, mm -hmm. which uh, hovers somewhere around two, three percent of the market. Um, w which is surprising, yeah. uh, you know, isn't it? To put it mildly. Um, you know, we were talking the other night about jazz musicians, uh, and you, you, I believe you had mentioned uh, Keith Jarrett and uh, his interest in the music of Bach, um, but then we went on and, you know, uh, and Chris Dan uh, has great interest in the music of Bach, and I find that to be uh, not terribly unusual uh, with the uh, jazz musicians that I know, uh, many of them. Uh, express an sure. interest in Bach, whether or not they uh, pursue that to, to what I would call a full professional or a public way. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them return to that. Well, that, that's something, that, that's an interesting, uh, you know, relationship between jazz and one of the great uh, classical Western composers. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, in, in my work as artistic director of the American Pianist Association, um, I often uh, program our jazz and classical fellows on, on the same uh, concert. And that mm -hmm. I, I, I enjoy that kind of mix sure. um, very, very much. I actually see 
things coming together. And one of the fascinating things to me uh, that I regard as a very positive development is uh, in people of Dan's uh, generation is that they're trying, you know, I don't, I don't hear them putting labels on things. And I really don't hear, you know, I don't even hear you particularly put, putting labels on things all the time. I resist labels yeah. as much as I and, possibly can. And you listen to such a wide variety of music and fully accept it all as uh, legitimate expressions of our, of our common humanity, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I see happening uh, more now than, uh, than when I was uh, your age. Um, and you know, the, uh, the great music schools of the United States, uh, uh, Juilliard and uh, New England and, and so on, um, you know, for, for most of the life of those schools have focused strictly on classical music. Uh, but now we have those schools offering uh, degrees in jazz. Yeah, getting back to the 1950s, one of the modernizers of the jazz piano, Lenin Tristano, before playing jazz at the concert or in the jazz club, he would start with the box inventions, yeah. two-part, three-part inventions to yeah. warm up and to kind of mobilize his mind for jazz improvisation. Yeah. And I think creative people, I think people uh, who are open to the creative impulse um, and, and have some understanding of, of the technical language uh, respond to great music. Yeah, I mean, let's, you know, but, but if it's good, it's who was it that says if it sounds good, Duke, it is. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, Duke Ellington yeah. said, let's not talk about styles. Let's talk about good and bad music. And I mean, I, I think I really the more I, th I experience this kind of thing, the more I feel it's, like it's completely childish to separate things out. I mean, there's a lot of jazz that bores me to death. There's a lot of sure. classical music that bores me to death. There's a lot of pop music that bores me to death. And they're also incredible gems in every field and I mean in fact the whole idea of separating things out like that is actually a pretty recent idea and it actually has to do with the music business it doesn't have anything to do with aesthetics for example take five the uh, Paul Desmond and Dave Brubeck Bricks. huge hit started out as you know just a tune on a jazz record someone heard it and sent it to radio stations the radio stations started playing it and it slowly made its way to where it was at the bottom of the top 50 mm -hmm. tunes that the people were were buying and listening to once it was on the top 50 it got played by all the radio stations all over the united states that played top 50 tunes and this was there because at the time there weren't separate charts for jazz and pop and classical it was just one chart so once it was there, people heard it, and they're like, this is fantastic, and it started making its way to the top. And, and Brubeck ended up on the cover of Time magazine. Exactly. <laughs> today, today that'd be impossible because, just because executives in the music business have decided to separate Yeah, but on the up. other hand, the fusion, the, this uh, tendency of fusing, you know, various genres and styles is also obvious in the history of jazz, start, uh, beginning with uh, cool jazz and then Miles Davis's kind of fusion experimentations in the 70s. Uh, I remember in 1956, Leonard Bernstein, well, I read about it, had, a, uh, two, had two lectures on uh, CBS uh, station, What is Jazz? Terrific yeah. lectures. I have those on record, Fant actually. I, I also have it. Yeah, Fantastic, right. with humor, with excellent right. knowledge of yeah. the music. And he says, today we can say that jazz is a serious music yeah. as, as an academic, right. on the same level as the academic right. music. And of course, it's about good or bad music. It's not about kind of genres or labels. Yeah. And Oscar Wilde comes to my mind, who said that there are neither moral nor immoral books, but only books well written or badly written. Getting back to this kind of... Uh, classics, uh, uh, topic of the classics and jazz music. Uh, uh, Dan, I know you're preparing yourself to do Bach's Goldberg Variations. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure at your age, insomnia is not kind of a <laughs> regular thing. I want to remind Except our I'm viewers... I'm in Georgia and I've just gotten uh, off the plane. <laughs> Try that. Jet -lag, yeah. <laughs> I want to remind our viewers, maybe the share box on the trains, then the very apilips, Ebza de Baron Shiasulos, Bach is Goldberg Variatiebi, Saris Erterti Shedevri, Saporte Piano Musicisa, Erterti Bomenti, Am Variatiebi, Sano Historia, Romer Dakao Shirebuli Amastan, Kulismo, Akao Shirebs, Am Opus, Uzi Lobastan, 
ეს თხზულება შეიქმნა მას შემდეგ რაც რუსეთის ელჩმა დრეზდენის სამეფო კარზე გრაფმა კაიზერლინგმა რომელსაც აწუხებდა უძილობა სთხოვა დრეზდენის სამეფო კარის მუსიკოს ბახს რომ შეიქმნა რა მეს ნაწარმოები რომელსაც შეასრულებდა მისი კლავესინისტი გოლბერგი ხამღამობით როდესაც მას აწუხებდა უძილობა და ბახმა შეიქმნა ეს ნაწარმოები რომელსაც დაარქვა შემდეგ გოლბერგ ვარიაციები და როგორც გითხარეთ ეს ერთ-ერთი ალბათ საუკეთესო ფილმებაა კლასიკური მუსიკის და არამარტო კლასიკური მუსიკის ისტორიაში და დენტეფერი აპირებს სწორედ ამის შესრულებას. ძალიან I remember that uh, one of the best interpreters of uh, Bach Glenn Gould did twice Goldberg variations. Yeah. Variations. First time it was when he was of your age 25. Yeah, 1955, yeah. Yeah. Why why Goldberg variations? What's what what brings you to this marvelous piece I understand it's but it's kind of challenging. It's, it's very, kind of challenging. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very complicated piece. Yeah, that's uh it's a very it's a very challenging piece. It's um I think it's one of those pieces that takes you know, it just takes a lifetime to really get a grasp on and I and I really believe that that's why Gould recorded it twice. He felt like he hadn't said everything he needed to say the first time even though he was a complete genius. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are really interesting interviews of him where he's talking about the 1980 version mm-hmm. and um the second one, yeah. the second one and talking about what it was that made him decide to do that. Um and there are lots of reasons, you know, he really felt like he needed to do that one. Um for me, I mean, my love affair with the Goldbergs has to do with Glenn Gould actually. It was um after hearing the 1980 recording when I was 14 years old or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um after that it, it's just never left my mind. I mean I've always had that that theme and the the way the variations come I've always had them in my mind they're absolutely exquisite it's just one of those works you know Bach is one of these guys who seems to have reached like the sublime in music almost accidentally in the way that I think what he was really focusing on was perfection getting everything perfect And most of the time when lesser human beings focus on perfection, they end up making music that's very boring. But Bach got it so perfect that bing, like when you get it to that level of perfection, all of a sudden everything opens up and you're seeing this unbelievable thing that transcends everything. And I think the Goldbergs, I mean they're they're a very mature work for Bach. Um I think they're like they're possibly the best example of that. Are you a perfectionist yourself? Am I a perfectionist? <laughs> Oof. <laughs> um I mean in music I am for sure. Yeah. But you know I I think I've uh I've evolved in the the way I think about that. I think uh for me I'm looking for perfection in feeling. I'm looking for an internal experience. that is completely comfortable all the time where i'm playing and i feel good and at ease all the time and i really believe that if if i feel that way inside the music is going to be good so i'm not so much focusing on you know everything being perfect and more focusing on the internal experience which i think uh i i don't know what you know i think bach maybe was focusing more on things being perfect but i'm not quite that brilliant so mm-hmm. you know <laughs> why don't you just uh show us a couple of kind of pieces which uh we have a piano here and uh maybe you'd like to just demonstrate some elements how classical jazz mu- music merge and uh uh Uh, what is uh what is this thing uh, that we just call that mutually enriching for these two kind of aspects of music mm-hmm. or any kind of piece you would like to play and later i would ask you uh, i would ask you to do one more thing okay okay Oops. um you know one of the things i find really interesting you, you know that bud powell was really into bach right Mm-hmm. And a lot of that has to do and Charlie Parker too. I mean basically all the bebop guys really appreciated Bach. And a lot of it has to do with this kind of this constant movement yeah. and this intricacy in the in the melodies mm-hmm. and also the rhythm because mm-hmm. Bach when it's well played and Glenn Gould is a great example of this. Bach when it's well played is intrinsically rhythmic, you know. 
You um, don't have even so to, it's very good, I mean, to apply jazz rhythm to Bach. You can swing Bach easily and uh, there is no problem with it. You yeah, can keep the structure, keep the structure right. as it is, just yeah. swing it right. and Even if fine. you don't swing it, it's still, it's, it's, it's still it swings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so maybe I'll play, uh, I hadn't thought about this before, but maybe I'll play um, one of the Goldberg variations and then I'll play a piece by Bud Powell. This is very interesting because our talk show is called Late Night Talk. Yeah. And it's uh, beyond midnight. <laughs> so Goldberg Variations, I think, uh, would be a good musical background for our kind That's of right. You know, actually, music. the Goldbergs have always interested me because, you know, a as you said, they were written for an insomniac. But they're not the kind of music that would put you back to sleep. Mm -hmm. Oh, of course <laughs> not if you're listening. Sure. And then another piece comes yeah. to my mind. This is a jazz piece, which is also dedicated to Midnight. It's Thelonious Monk's, one of my favorite pieces, called Round Midnight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, if you could come up with uh, also some dialogue between these two pieces. Oh. I know I'm asking something crazy, <laughs> maybe, but it's very, very postmodernist type of thing. That sounds like fun. Um, <laughs> okay, let's have fun. Hmm. We don't want to sleep. Okay. All right. Let's see what happens. Hmm.
Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Very beautiful. interesting. If, beautiful. If you ever come up with the idea of elaborating this piece yeah. uh, and recording it, don't forget to say thanks Credit to you. me. I'll, yeah. give you, I'll, <laughs> to quote me. I'll give you 20%. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, it was really, I mean, inspiring. Inspiring uh, and uh, very interesting. I, well, uh, I've heard a lot of exquisite jazz musicians improvising on Bach. Uh, well, Jacques Lucier, who has done a lot yeah. in these terms, but uh, the most uh, interesting to me still uh, remains uh, John Lewis, who mm. did both volumes of well-tempered uh, clavier, clavier yeah. called the jazz bar, jazz bar, yeah. uh, jazz, jazz bar, and uh, he's also very careful about, you know, uh, he he plays, he keeps the texture, and suddenly finds the place where he can easily intrude and elaborate. Uh, the jazz style and uh, uh, the bluesy, bluesy style, and to me, it is one of the most uh, kind of uh, refined jazz interpretation of Bach I've ever heard. This is an excellent uh, combination. He did in 1984 or something mm. like this. Uh, I'm s I'm afraid our time is kind of already exhausted. Uh, I'd like to say thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for kind of coming to our show. Uh, it was one, one of the most kind of extraordinary shows I've had so far okay. before, uh, and especially with the combination yeah. of round midnights and Goldberg variations. Yeah, it's a nice idea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I might do that again. Well, yeah. this, everything good comes from spontaneous kind yeah. of cooperation. <laughs> uh, and uh, maybe Dan will do just one more farewell piece. Uh, just very short one. Anything that you want to, okay. to say good night to our uh, viewers, and uh, maybe they will stay awake all night after this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, you Surely. know, this is this is kind of like a an interesting <coughs> kind of ancient electric piano, and yeah, it's maybe very, I, it's, I, it's, I, I want to try to find something that that fits the piano. We'll okay. see. <laughs> this is a heroic piano. It survived civil war, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me say goodbye to the to the audience and then we'll start. Twenty uh, eight hours ago, Abu Yusuf had made me the dagem shudobot. Did he matloba? Rom Guisman did the Guisker did the made me the tchovo dente first rom dagem shudobot. So I say we rame musicaluri padara nazar moedit. Rame shudobot se kargab zane bot. Sonata. You know, actually, yeah, I played Which that one? when I was when I was young. That's the short one, right? Which no, one? The third is the short one. Oh. The seventh is uh, is one of the war sonatas, but it's the uh, the last.
Tāds, ka man dodāju, es uztagājuši internetas. Arcetī, tā tu mums nērts mēvari. Orju, kā es saku, arcetī jau vienu cīļu. Gargi, Dāvids Kups. Pīc kā ir to visu kremi, tad Dāvids Kups. Žemīlijā. Kāds ir kuši, mīkā viņi šiem tūkajot laringolog tā, mūs nekā māk. Ja, kitām kārēm māk, tur vēl tās zēnē būtu.